Before we move on to the second stage, I want to talk a little bit more about the first stage and especially about how to avoid having unnecessary interventions in this first stage of labor. And the first and most important way, I would say, is by being really committed to natural birth and by having a caregiver who also favors natural birth. So I always think it's much easier to change your caregiver than it is to change your caregiver's mind. So in the interview process, as you are exploring your own beliefs and what feels important to you, you wanna find a caregiver that's on the same page with you and uh, being able to ask questions about what their beliefs are, what their outcomes are, um, is important because if you have a caregiver that is very pro-epidural, a, a caregiver that's very pro-pitocin, a caregiver that's even pro-cesarean, that's very good information for you to have up front. And if you're very committed to natural birth, if you encounter a caregiver like that, it would be good to continue your search until you find someone, potentially a midwife, because they are trained um, much more in natural birth than a medical doctor often is, uh, depending on their training, of course. They may have gone above and beyond uh, in their training, but most medical doctors have never been to a home birth. They've never seen a birth that has not required some kind of medical intervention. So that's important is to be able to, to understand that and just see where, where they lean in all of this. Um, and then your own commitment matters. So of course we get no guarantees in this journey of childbirth. We can prepare and have the strongest of intentions that we want a natural birth and have a left turn happen in labor with the best of caregivers and um, we end up with a cesarean. That, that obviously can happen. But the statistics are that the more committed a mom is to natural birth, the more likely she is to have a natural birth. So in your journey of understanding birth, understanding your body, understanding um, what is gonna work best for you and your baby in meeting each other, right? It's a very sacred, important event. Um, this is a really good thing to give some time to. So if anyone is interested, please, send me a message in the in the comments. I will get back in touch with you and find out a way of sending you some information on the downside of epidurals. If I have enough people ask, I'll make another video about the downside of epidurals. And my intention in talking about the downside is not because I'm anti-epidural. It's because we all know what the upside is, right? If you do not want to feel discomfort, have an epidural. If you want to feel nothing, um, but there are downsides and it is an intervention. And as we talked about before, interventions sometimes set off that domino effect of one intervention leading to the next, leading to the next. And um, if you wanna let nature take its course, then it's good to avoid the first intervention in the first place. So please message me if you want to understand the downside of epidurals because it can really help you commit to natural birth, right? If you're on the fence and you're thinking like, I don't know, I'll, I'll see how it goes, you're much more likely to get an epidural than someone who's really committed and has said, unless it's medically necessary, I do not want to have an epidural. Well, then you're much more likely not to have one. So the next piece that I wanna talk about is there, there are a couple of interventions that can happen are, are pretty, not typical, but are uh, prevalent, I guess, in our society. And so I wanna help you understand why they're prevalent and understand what do you do if you're presented with these interventions. So the first one I wanna talk about is rupturing the bag of waters or the amniotic sac. So the amniotic sac is the bag of waters that your baby is in, inside of your uterus. And um, many, pregnant mamas think that they're gonna know that they go into labor because their water is gonna break. And that is not always the case. So um, in two of my labors, the water didn't break um, to tell me I was in labor. My third baby, it did. Um, and my second baby was born in the bag of waters, still intact. So 
the bag of waters not only doesn't have to break for you to go into labor, it doesn't have to break at all. And of course, it is broken once the baby comes out in order for them to be able to start to breathe and all the rest. But um, it's a very natural thing to have your bag of water stay intact for a significant portion of your labor. So the thing I want to um, tell you is that there are caregivers that will recommend that you break the bag of waters. And there are a couple of reasons to question this. And one is because once your bag of waters is broken, you're on a timeline. There is a timeline to get your baby out, or there's fear that bacteria could get inside of that bag of waters. And so sometimes when a mama's uh, bag of waters has been broken for a period of time, a caregiver will put them on IV antibiotics uh, in order to fight the potential infection that could be happening. So, um, and there are caregivers that have a timeline. You know, they could have a timeline of 12 hours. That would be very short could be 24 hours, could be 48 hours, where they say you have to have your baby out by this time. So these are questions to ask your caregiver and to know about like, okay, is having my bag of waters broken? Does that put me on a timeline? Will I be put on IV antibiotics? Um, these are all questions that are important to know. And the statistic that I've been, that I have researched and understand, and I know that there is probably other information out there, so I'm just passing on what I know um, or what I think I know, uh, is that breaking the bag of waters will increase the speed of labor on average by 15 minutes. So what this means to me is that um, if there is an emergency, 15 minutes can be life-saving, right? That's important. But if it's not an emergency, this is not going to buy you a whole ton of time. This is not going to shorten your labor by hours. Um, so that's an important thing is really understanding the medical necessity of what's being offered to you. And um, I have another uh, piece of paper that I am happy to send to you if you want to put a question in the comments that is all about informed consent and questions to ask about informed consent so that you understand um, what you what your rights are and and just how to ask questions in a good way, how to advocate for yourself. And I am not a doctor. I am not trying to give you medical advice. Please, please, please understand that. My intention is that you understand what's happening, right? It's empowering to understand what's happening. It's important. This is your body. This is your baby. This is your birth experience. Um, it's not meant to question uh, and make sure that you have a, a, a medical degree by the time you give birth. That That's not it at all. It's really about um, you understanding why you're saying yes to something or why, um, why you might say no to it. So one of the things that I think is a really excellent question to ask your caregiver, and again, I can send you a list of them if you message me in the comments, and if enough people message me, I will make a video about it. Um, but if you, the, the one question that I think is the standalone question for any intervention that's being offered to you is to say to your caregiver, what would happen if we waited 30 minutes? And it almost doesn't matter what your caregiver says, it's how they say it. So if your caregiver looks at you and shrugs their shoulder and says, all right, I'll be back in a half hour. Well, that's great. That means it was not a medical necessity. There's no emergency. Phew. Great. Then you have time to talk about it with your birth partner. You have time to talk about it with your doula um, and to just give some space for labor to continue. If your caregiver looks at you like you are insane and says, absolutely not in panic, we do not have that kind of time, then we're talking medical necessity. So this is an important piece just to understand that you can get very valuable information just by asking that simple question.